be prefer if I turned it off to quote a very, very, very old joke. Anyway, very good morning and uh, very good afternoon. And uh, welcome to this session on DXing on a shoestring. I have to say, I didn't actually write the title myself. Um, it, it kind of, kind of was uh, passed on to me. And I think I should explain that I think that uh, without spending loads of money is a slightly relative term. Um, if I mention to you that I, I think the figure I saw for uh, one of the forthcoming uh, de-expeditions is uh, $600,000. Uh, in those terms, this is dead cheap. Um, if you're living in a mud hut in the middle of, say, Uganda, a place quite well known to me, um, we're talking about quite a, a, lot of, a serious lot of money. But I'm trying to pitch it as a kind of rel relative point in terms of, uh, of amateur radio. I'm going to be talking about being on the DX end of a pile-up rather than uh, DXing in the UK. So um, I hope you'll see that the principles still apply and you can have a lot of fun whichever end of a pile-up you actually happen to be on. We might try with that door shut, but we'll see. It's pretty warm in here. I've always had a rather kind of careful attitude towards expenditure on, on amateur radio. Um, I like to be quite frugal in everything I do and get some satisfaction from seeing what can be done without too much of a financial outlay. <laughs> anyway, for those of you who don't know me, getting round to the introduction, which uh, wasn't made, uh, I'm Nick Henwood and um, my call sign is G3RWF, so I've been around a while. And um, you'll see that I've obviously... Um, been around uh, DXing for quite a bit as well, and I now, as you can see, have the privilege to be the president of the RSGB. I need to tell you, um, for those who haven't worked me, that I'm not a communications professional. So you don't need to sit there and say, well, you know, this guy, you know, you've probably seen some today already, this guy makes transceivers about, out of the sweepings of his junk box, um, and then works the world. Well, um, you may be thinking you wouldn't know where to start. I'd be thinking that exactly the same thing with you. I wouldn't know where to start either. But I do enjoy finding out about things, uh, and I guess that's something which probably unites all of us. And I've always been interested in finding out about things ever since little monsters like that were around, which some of you may remember, and used to be able to buy them for £4.19 and 6 And that's pretty frugal, really. I have a funny suspicion that the, uh, the government paid rather more for them uh, during the war. OK, so you want to go somewhere where you'll be the DX and have people calling you. Very self-indulgent, but great fun. It's one of the great things, I think, which keeps uh, amateur radio DXing alive these days. When I was first, when I was first licensed, there were many expatriate uh, amateur radio operators, and some of you will remember those. Guys, you could almost imagine sitting under a tree somewhere getting their knees brown and droning on on AM on some band. God, you'd be really seriously old to remember all that. But anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> but, I mean, if you wanted to work Angola, for example, uh, there were lots of people in Angola, uh, and you, you could work all of those. And, in fact, I, I, uh, I, I was there. I, I was in East Africa as a voluntary service overseas volunteer in 1963, yes, <laughs> and then I returned in 68. And I do remember stations like that. Some of you may remember, that's, that was a very famous call sign, actually, VQ4ERR, 5Z4ERR, Robbie Robson. And uh, he was kind of top of everything at that stage. And you notice, so that was, uh, that was in his home uh, in, in Nairobi, and he was very much a, a resident amateur. These were not people who jumped into a plane, spent a short, of time, uh, spent a short amount of time, but they weren't permanently settled. Anyway, as I mentioned, at the tender age, age of 18, I went off and did VSO, and unlike people with real jobs, uh, I just arrived there with a suitcase. I had had my amateur radio license for quite a while, in fact. I'd got it in March, and I was there in August. So I wasn't a particularly expert operator at that stage, and I also had nothing with me except for my license. Oh, and some clothes, and my return ticket but no amateur radio gear. But people were really great, actually, and they lent me stuff, and I fell in with a very small group of people who were doing amateur radio in Sierra Leone, as it were. So um, you can't do amateur radio much cheaper than that, turning up without, without anything. And I came across such stalwarts as these. Some of you may have seen 
this picture before, the wonderful R107 band spread, all the amateur bands in about three millimetres, and the DX40, which changed frequency so fast you couldn't actually run to catch it. Um, and actually, that was a picture of me going back 45 years and a civil war later. So what about today? That was what it was like in the past. Well, it's all changed, of course. Long term, residential expatriates are pretty rare now. And DXing is pretty much about de-expeditions, aren't they? I mean, that, that's what's been going on in this room all day, people talking about DXing. Now, I want to say, I'm, I'm, be careful here, I'm not actually into a pitch about opposing de-expeditions. Uh, and, I mean, here is a picture of the intrepid Braveheart, and it was terrific listening about it down in, the, uh, uh, in South Georgia and so, so on this morning. But the cost does seem to have grown enormously. And now the ambition about de-expeditioning de seems to be linked to some of those sorts of, uh, of, of expenditure. And I think that's great for some people, if you've got a huge pension pot, or even, indeed, if you're a radio amateur in this country and you've got plenty of money to pay five pounds for a QSO to go on Logbook of the World. And, indeed, some people are almost beginning to suggest that if you're going to do DXing, you've got kind of got a responsibility to pay. Now, I don't belong to that generation, and I don't really want to get into that argument. I'm just saying chacun a son goût, I think, is French. Something to do with every everyone having their own choice. So I'd love to go on one of those trips, I think. I'm not sure about some of the things I saw this morning. <laughs> but I'm interested in the opposite end of the spectrum, de simply and cheaply. And I want to put a, a, a little hypothesis to you, because is it just about the most, most wanted? Because everybody looks at, uh, I mean, if you look at Club, um, club Log, for, for example, you can look up what are the most wanted in which countries. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant analysis. But I just have this theory that if everybody thinks that the only important countries in the world to work are the top five or people are dying to get to North uh, Vietnam or, or whatever, there's an awful lot of people going to miss out on an awful lot of really good DXing. And I just did a little very, very simple bit of mathematics. If you'd worked 100 countries, what would be the next country that you might work, looking at the European Club Log Most Wanted list. In other words, is it, as I might have read on some websites, something really boring that we all worked ages ago and no one could possibly want to work ever again, or is it actually somewhere that might be slightly interesting? Well, there you are. If you worked, after, or if you worked 150 countries, the next one, Andorra, and then Galapagos. The number's in that order because that's going towards the, the most wanted. Well, I think you might think those are quite interesting, actually. Andorra wasn't always interesting, actually. It used to have lots of people going to Andorra, but now if you're not Andorran, it's a bit tricky. Um, the Galapagos, quite regularly visited, but still, I think, I would suggest, my hypothesis is that's still got a lot of interest, and it's got a lot of interest of people who are new to DXing and new to the hobby. And if you go um, a bit further uh, down the list... If you work 200, those are the next two. I think you might think that those are actually quite interesting, is, 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 is my hypothesis. So let's not do those down. I'm saying there's quite a lot to, of fun to be had in the middle of the wanted list. And that's where the opportunity for somebody to go along and get involved in, in, uh, in, in that comes on. So the, we do not need to be obsessed by um, five kilowatt rigs things that need, you know, three-phase mains, giant antennas, uh, you know, if you haven't got a beam, you're nobody, obsessive contesting, well, I mean, Laurie's here, actually, talking about no beams, yes, I mean, lots and lots of wire success on, D on DX. Um, so we don't need to be obsessed by that. We don't need obsessive filling of band slots, bad, bad operator with computer assistance actually making it even, even worse. You can do it in a much more simple way. So my hypothesis is the little pistol does stand a, stand a chance, the small station, and um, you don't necessarily have to be up there at the top. I mean, you're not going to get there up there at the top without working your way up there anyway. So if we're going to... My, my point is, if we're going to retain interest in DXing, uh, actually, um, the views of the 300-plus country DXers are important 
But actually, the views of a lot of other people are equally important, in fact, because they are what's going to keep things going. And when you read people going on about, um, uh, about contesting, for, for example, and totally forgetting that you only contest because other people take part, not just the winners, kind of, you can lose the plot quite easily. So, it's not, it's not all lost. Why do we do it? Well, I would claim it's about fun. If it's not about fun, actually, what on earth are we doing it for? We're just beating ourselves up, aren't we? So, principally about fun. But by fun, I don't mean, you know, kind of good belly laugh, just let's have a bit of a joke. I mean the sort of fun which actually gives you uh, good outcomes, where you plan something carefully, you apply your brains to it, and you produce uh, something worthwhile. So, if you think about it, many pastimes are about pitting yourself against challenges. I think that's where you get the fun and the sense of achievement. So, what might we be doing in terms of amateur radio? Some suggestions. I think there's a, some of the bits that would go into it. And those are interesting, I would suggest. Planning, preparation, knowledge, the right kit, learning from experience, enjoying success. That, that is about having fun. You may not agree. That's, uh, that's uh, again, part of, uh, of my hypothesis. Okay, so if you've half-swallowed my story, you may not even have half-swallowed it, you decide you're going to go off somewhere and have some fun and uh, give some experience to other DXs. Next question, how do you do that on a shoestring? I think that's part of the fun. Where you go depends on several factors, of course, and the amount of difficulty you want to face. Do you want to go to South Georgia, or do you want to go somewhere a bit easier? So I would suggest the first thing you do is you decide on a couple of places which are contenders. Talk to people, get an idea, look at the lists, all other things. And you decide which, which ones might be of interest to you and the DX commu community. I, some of these questions, when you've finished scratching your head, might be these ones. How would I get a license? If you haven't actually been anywhere else, that is a pretty important question. How would I get a license? Question next. If I go there, where am I going to stay? Do I want to stay in that nice hut in South Georgia, or do I want to be in a tent that blows away? It can be arranged. I thought they were very brave, actually. Intrepid, even. How do you get there? because that ties in with money and lots of other things as well. What are the travel costs? This is where, you know, travelling on a shoestring comes in. Do I speak the language? That might be important. And uh, is it safe? Well, would you get, how do you get a licence? That is really a, a very important question. Um, do some research. Find out who's been there recently. Ask them how they got a licence. But the crucial thing, actually, if you can possibly manage it, is to have somebody uh, on the ground who's uh, doing legwork for you. You're very unlikely to succeed by writing a letter to uh, an African licensing department, who I may suggest, because they won't read your letter, and they certainly won't reply, and you'll probably regret having, having started there. So you need to make that kind of um, local contact. I mean, in fact, I've, I've been to Rwanda a few times in the last few years. Some of you will have worked me there. And I tried for a while, because Rwanda was just down the road from where I was in Uganda. And I thought, I must get there. It doesn't look too difficult. It's actually further up the most wanted list, and it would be very cheap. fits those other criteria. Um, but after all sorts of attempts, it was only when I finally got the name uh, of one person I could actually contact who would answer emails, talk to the telephone, uh, that uh, doors began to open. So, Ural Gakwandi, you just get a gold point. Um, so... A lot of work goes into getting a license. So if you're planning to go somewhere um, on your own, you need to do your homework on that. And there's a, a collection of, of uh, little efforts. Uh, that's Uganda, easy. That's Namibia, easy. That's Sierra Leone, unbelievably expensive. Uh, that's Kenya. Well, I've just renewed last year's license because they didn't reply for X months. Uh, that's Rwanda. They have a different meaning of the word license from ours. Uh, as you will notice, and there's another, oh, Lesotho, yeah, Lesotho, wonderful, got a big gold stamp on it and cost almost nothing, but uh, did take a fair amount of getting. 
So it's important if you want to go and DX um, on your own, on the cheap as it were, not doing a, a reconnaissance first, as any big de-expedition would do, whether you can get a license. Next thing, you want some modestly priced accommodation. Well, that's a um, house I know is available for occupancy in, uh, in Uganda, but I wouldn't recommend that. Um, and having accommodation, having a license go together. Because there is no, if you, if you get the license, we haven't got anywhere to stay, or if the place that you stay is actually at the bottom of a hill just behind a municipal car park, uh, you may have disappointing results. So you do need to sort out where to stay, and that's where the internet's really become quite helpful. And uh, that's a place I stay in, in uh, Rwanda, which is called the Good News Guest House. The bad news about good news is good news means no alcohol. But um, they've come around, and they have to put alcohol in the fridge for me, which is very kind, because they're not, not allowed to touch it th theoretically. That came from the internet, and you can find places on the internet, you can see the price, and uh, of course you can actually now scan it with Google, Google Earth to see what the takeoff is like. You won't get a perfect um, you know, perception of what it's going to be like, but it'll be, it'll be pretty good. So that's quite a reasonable place to go and stay, or it was until they built the extension, which they didn't tell me about. And that was another place I stayed in uh, Kenya last year, which was a wonderful uh, kind of settler's little cottage for members of the family who were working up country. It, it's, the decorations were just amazing. And I totally failed to find a table that's square. And I, I really don't recommend operating from a circular table. It's ever so, it's ever so difficult. <laughs> but anyway, it was a great place apart, apart from that. So you do need to find a place to stay. And that's where, again, talking to people uh, comes into it. Now, getting there. It is important to choose a good airline. I, I like that picture. I just Im imagine how a plane ever got to that state where the engines actually dropped off and were left where they were. I suspect it was something to do with the Biafran War, but I'm not an expert on, on planes, but it looks like something really quite terrible has happened to that. Anyway, the point I'm making is the cost of airline travel does vary enormously. And uh, that may well be where how you do it on a shoestring comes into, into operation. If you go somewhere that's got uh, a tourist industry of any type, you can probably get quite reasonably pr priced tickets. If you go somewhere that hasn't, uh, you will probably have to pay quite a lot of money. So that's an important bit of, uh, a bit of research. But I would just say there are plenty of places where you can get cheap tickets that are actually quite interesting. The other thing that comes into, uh, into that, actually, is, and this may sound getting pretty anoraki and a bit boring, and that's the question of luggage. Uh, I mean, I came here on Thursday from Cyprus with Ryanair. Um, didn't bring a lot of luggage. Um, wouldn't be enough to actually put a station on the air. So you do need to uh, do quite a careful analysis. This is where, you know, are you interested in doing this kind of thing, or is this kind of whatever? But you do need to do an analysis. Some airlines will let you have two bags, even if you travel cattle class. Others won't. Some of them will really sting you. So you've got to go into the, into the small print of that. So all the preparation is about kind of getting these bits of information together. Can you get a license? Can you get accommodation? Got to get there for a reasonable price. How do I avoid really being hammered on, uh, on, on uh, extra money for, for, uh, um, for, for, uh, for luggage? I quite like that picture. Depends on how well you know Nigel. I don't think Nigel's here, is he? No, well, you can tell him, tell him about it later. But uh, it's quite extraordinary the amount of kit you can actually take onto a plane, but I wouldn't recommend particularly the amount that uh, she has got there. Security, I think, I wouldn't have mentioned probably a couple of years ago, but I think that's important as well. I would just check on the Foreign Office website to see when they last had a revolution. Um, it's been very recent, I wouldn't go. Um, Actually, another, another good site, and I'm not joking, is, is the CIA website, actually. It's uh, got very good analysis of, uh, of, of, of most countries. Um, so whether you're doing an amateur radio trip or planning a coup, uh, you need to get these um, bits of information <laughs> brought together. Then, of course, there's, there may be language, whether you actually speak it. 
I've almost always gone for countries where they speak English because I think I speak English. Um, if you speak French, that'll take you into a whole load more countries, particularly in Africa. This is about colonialism, of course. If you go to Rwanda, they, they decided to speak English after the genocide because they didn't actually want to speak French. Uh, so now they speak uh, English, French, Swahili, and, and another language as well. So negotiating where you're going in a taxi is, is quite good fun. So kind of peeling off the bits that, uh, the bits that you do. The next bit we come to is actually the journey. I think this is the, very, this is the most stressful bit. It's like, same as going on holiday. Isn't the worst bit about the holiday actually, you know, getting there and the kind of uh, things you have to go through? Um, now, you've got your two bags. One of them probably involves a golf bag. Golf bags are, hold something just about four feet long and you can get loads of stuff into them. If you look on the airline's websites, you'll discover they say, Things like uh, they may only contain golf clubs. You may only have up to six golf clubs, one pair of socks, one appalling pullover with stripes on it and a pair of plus fours or, or you know, a pair of those funny boots with strange laces on them. So you're not actually sticking by their rules when you take the, 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 the golf bag. So the golf bag is a bit of a, bit of a thing there. Um, how much can you crab, cram into it? How close can you get to uh, 23 kilograms, which is uh, a magic figure for most airlines? Other little questions too. If you check in wearing an anorak, which is to be recommended because they've got very big pockets, how much can you get into the anorak? I mean, you can get a power supply into an anorak, no, no particular problem. Uh, you, can get a, you can get a morse key, they're pretty heavy, uh, well worth getting, uh, getting rid of. So these are kind of your emergency tactics as to how you're actually going to get there. Also, when you come up to the, uh, when you come up to the, the check-in desk, you've done the, your normal survey of the people and think, does it look fair touch? Yeah, that looks a bit keen, that one there. That one's already having trouble. So you decide which one you're going to come up to. Uh, you ask all those difficult questions. So when they say things to, like, things to you like, are you going on a golfing holiday? What you say is, well, well I'm hoping it's going to be warmer than here. Don't answer the question. Um, or you might want to say, um, do I have to take the bag to the normal oversized checking? Don't answer whether or not it's a golf cart. Don't tell lies, in other words, would be my view. Don't necessarily answer the question, though, and you generally will get away with it. Um, a lot of them seem to think you're Tiger Woods. Do they really want to discover that you've got a bag full of old aluminium poles and odd bits and pieces? Somebody once said to me, I've looked at your bags, I've looked at your bags in the scanner, and they're full of wire. This is in Africa. And I said, yes. And he just looked at me, and I looked at him, and he moved on to the next question. So don't offer too much by way of answer, because uh, there's no point explaining. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, air, whatever, you know, and it's uh, 50 ohms, and this is the loss, and all this kind of stuff. Don't offer more than you, than you need to. So leaving the UK really is the easy bit. The tricky bit's landing in the, in the foreign country, and the, there are a few appalling stories about that. And I think generally it's because people have uh, played their, haven't quite got their, uh, their, their cards kind of sorted out. But there you arrive, you've got all these hefty bags and you're on your own. And um, lots of people in African countries in particular uh, are very interested in, in some addition to their very meagre stipends. So um, there you are. It's a difficult, it's a difficult situation. Um, but generally, I don't lie. And, um, but you do a few other things. You don't engage in... in uh, you, you don't make eye contact if you possibly can. And as I say, you uh, d don't offer any more information than you can possibly get away with. I, I, but I think it was last year, I had a very interesting, <laughs> very interesting discussion about contents of the golf bag, about how many golf clubs there were and how much they were going to charge me as, as import duty. And then I, then I decided I would break my rule and I would drone on about, CD, uh, about CQWW and uh, all this kind of stuff. And actually, they, they got almost as bored as quite a number of people I talked to about the same topic. And uh, we moved on from, uh, from the discussion of how much to, uh, to, to pay. So, when they ask you about the radios, you usually say, it's a radio. It's worth mentioning the BBC, because they all know about the BBC. Um, I was somewhere, and uh, 
actually this was the voodoo we were in Sierra Leone and we were checking out and we got to the final stage I was next to Gary G4 IRN ZL2 IF sorry G4 IFB uh, ZL2 IFB and I was having a hard time with a with a young lady I, th I got right to the end of the here's a couple of dollars bit and uh, she got this K3 out and she said what is this I said well, it's, a, it's a radio and it's mentioned BBC and then she said uh, I, is it for security? I said, mm. I said is, it, is it for spying? I thought, these are subtle questions they've done in their training course. <laughs> and I said, mm. and, then, and then Gary, Gary had came up just next to me, and he opened up his case, and he pulled out his K3. <laughs> so she asked him another question. I said, it's the same as that. She said, oh, fine. That was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was getting quite close to, to you know, how much money. Um, but there we are. As I mentioned, I don't recommend bribes. I quite like that, really. We're now proudly accepting bribes. They put that on the walls of most African uh, uh, places as you go in. OK, so that's just a few bits and pieces about how you get there, if that's what you decide you want to do. Um, and I think, in a sense, that's quite good fun. The only, the only, the only real bit of tension in my mind is, is about your luggage and the weight and whether you're going to end up being charged duty on it all. I mean, that really would be quite tedious and could be quite difficult, particularly if bribes come into it. But I've been, I have been extremely lucky on that. Next thing, equipment. What to take with you? Well, of course, uh, I talked earlier on about, uh, you know, the days of VQ 4 e R and uh, the sort of stations that were around then. I'm sure you've seen bigger stations than that. We just had this wonderful, really, uh, transformation in terms of weight of, equip weight of equipment. Um, 817's been around quite a long time. Some of you will know that. I think that's the KX2, which came out uh, earlier this year. Smaller, lighter, better in every possible way. So it really has been, uh, things have been transformed. Uh, in terms of equipment you can take. This is where I do just make my point about it not necessarily being particularly cheap. But they're not terribly expensive, relatively. Uh, so I, I've been using a, a K3 for some years now, and actually when I bought it, and this is a, a happy moment to mention this, the, there were more than $2 to the pound. Um, yes, exactly. So uh, I, I, uh, I, got it, I got it for a good price. But uh, these smaller, lighter rigs are, are, are very good. And I mean, you just see K3s everywhere. No doubt we'll be into, um, into SDR for this. You also need a, you need a power supply, of course. And actually, I use um, there's one called the Power Mite, which is very light, 1.2 kilos. And uh, that's done pretty well. I'm on my second. The first one finally got destroyed by various strange problems to do with African power supplies, uh, you know, main supply, as it were. And that's um, the slightly higher power version with the uh, G3PJT Linear, which was uh, the predecessor of my KPI KPA 500, which Bob very kindly lent me, but unfortunately didn't work quite as well when I brought it back as when I took it, but he was very nice about it. OK, so just a few thoughts on, on, on light equipment. It's really not that difficult now, and you won't have much struggle. I, I, I should have mentioned much earlier on that you don't, I've never had trouble getting equipment out of the UK. You just show it to them. You don't try and hide it. You just say, do you want to have a look? And they have a look, and they say, that's fine. There was an American, um, there were some Americans on, um, I haven't been on many de-expeditions, but on, you know, on a multi-operated de-expedition. In fact, AA7A, if you saw the, uh, Ned, uh, on the, the first thing this morning, they, uh, they, brought, they brought linear amplifiers from the States to, uh, this was for CQ, uh, CQ Worldwide CW in, in Sierra Leone. And they, they dismantled the amplifiers and they put the, the transformer inside their cabin luggage. And they did it by putting a kind of metal bar bolted to the framework and then the transformer was you know, screwed to that. So this extremely heavy uh, carry-on cabin luggage, which had actually got a transformer inside. And when he came through, uh, when he came through UK, um, he, was, he was stopped uh, as it went through the, through the scanner. And I don't know how this happened, but uh, he, he was put down with his little chutes. They opened it up. And there's this guy came down. And he said, just looked at it. He said, oh, that's a transformer. That's OK. <laughs> he, he thought he was about to lose the most, of the, uh, most important part of the linear amplifier, probably. 
What about antennas? Well, you need to go simple. And I think um, that's a great antenna. The only problem is that you may need to move the C in order to make it work well. But the, the vertical dipole array, which is, uh, which is really a moxon, actually, sort of on its side, if you can possibly get it above water, it just is brilliant. And I'm, we've been on the receiving end now. A few people have used vertical dipoles, dipole arrays. They're very simple to make. They're very light. They collapse to very small proportions, and they absolutely, uh, they really do, do the stuff if you can get their, get their feet into, into salt water. And I, a couple of years ago, I went to Scotland. Just, I just wanted to try it for myself because Uganda's a bit short of sea for some obscure reason. Um, and so I, we, we stuck that up in one of the locks, and uh, I re it really was wonderful, just with a uh, uh, battery-driven K3. So that would be my favourite. You can get C. Also, you need the C pointing in the right direction as well. So there's a number of small points to, to bear in mind there. But generally, and this may disappoint you, that uh, generally I just use an inverted V dipole. That isn't an inverted V dipole, but there's an inverted V dipole up there. And this is my luxury apartment in, uh, in Fort Portal. In fact, that picture does it some favours of the truth were known. But um, it's not difficult to do that. All you need is a 10-metre fishing pole, find yourself something else and lash it to it and, and, and lash the two together with some big jubilee clips which you can take with you. This actually I think was, um, was actually a tree I bought. I think it cost me about four pounds. I chose it. It was still growing when I bought it. Um, but you can easily buy a 20 foot length of uh, water pipe for example and you just, just do them there with jubilee clips and you've got yourself an antenna at about 40 feet. Now that will work really well. And a, a dipole at 40 feet really actually is effective. Put a dipole up with some links in it. You can just about manage a halyard on that. And uh, you've got yourself on the air on all bands. That, by the way, is actually a uh, two-element moxon fall, I think 15 metres. And I was feeling a little, little ambitious that year. So antennas, don't be too complicated, but get something up in the air a long way. Don't be surprised. If you just stick it at some low level, if really nothing much works. That is my current partial residence, and that's got inverted V dipole on the top of uh, this rather metal house in Cyprus. In fact, the antenna is still there waiting for me to return. Another consideration is how you make them. Dead cheap. Make it yourself. Use plastic covered wire. I use as you can see, they're car connectors. I've tried all sorts of things. i tried crocodile clips. They catch on everything. I tried the torpedo-shaped ones. They tend to stick. These are quite good for repairing. Uh, I'm not sure that's the right sort of criterion, but, um, you know, those, those are the links for changing the bands. If you don't take enough insulators, they make brilliant insulators. I had some trouble with, uh, I think, 80 metres sparking across a rather small indicator. A bottle, no problem, hole in each end, and you've got yourself a wonderful insulator, in fact. And another thing uh, to consider is feeder. There's no point in carting a whole load of heavy feeder, and uh, along with many other people, I think now, my, my preferred feeder would be SL5. I mean, there's RG213, and you can see that's the, uh, I think it's 100 foot loss, 2.1 dB. SL5 is 2.93, and that's, that's not that far away. Uh, and I put the figure in there for, for Mini 8, which is roughly the same physical size but more expensive. So SL5, it'll happily take the best part of a kilowatt without coughing, providing you don't run it into totally uh, unmatched antennas to start with. So the, the feeders you're taking are important, and you need good quality, and, but those are quite light. Personally, I, uh, I don't take ATUs. I think they, uh, they tend to absorb power and make things very complicated for simple cells like me. But I do think that an antenna analyzer is absolutely vital. I've just updated it from the MFJ, whatever it was, that uh, I've had for many years. And um, that's a, a really, really useful bit of kit to tell you what's going on if you don't want to take a whole load of, uh, load of stuff with you. Well, that's... A rough indication of how many times I've been to places with simple equipment like that. 
um, quite a lot of times, as, as you can see. I think I began by throwing wires over trees. Then I discovered and began my love affair with uh, fishing poles. <laughs> I discovered how useful they were. Uh, and I've gradually kind of built up from there. I've now got a number of fishing poles hidden away. Got one not there. I've got some poles hidden there. Uh, I've got some poles hidden there. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's just about it. But uh, you don't need to bring stuff back. If you think you're going back, just, just leave it so you don't, don't have to, to bring it the next time. I think it's about somewhere around, not far short of now, about 250,000 QSOs there, one way and another. So you can have a lot of fun without spending too much money, OK? I've not spent a fortune. Well, you might disagree, but I don't think I've spent a fortune. And so there we are. The Tropic of Capricorn and the equator, all stations in between. That's uh, generally where I've tended to concentrate because, of course, the other thing that you need to consider if you are travelling with relatively low power, simple antennas, is don't get yourself in a position where you can't have any QSOs because it's pretty disappointing, I can assure you. Uh, so you need to look at propagation and decide what's possible, bearing in mind where we are in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the solar cycle at, at the present time. So I hope that uh, some of you may feel that's something you'd, you'd like to do. I still think it's, it's uh, perfectly achievable, even with the sunspot cycle declining at a fairly rapid rate at the, uh, at, at the present time. But um, you, can, you can do it on a shoestring. You don't even need to spend the sort of money that I've been talking about there. I think it's great fun. And I would say that we will not survive on mega de-expeditions. We will survive on people getting some of that kit and getting out and doing it. And if they're not doing it abroad, doing it here would do. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're living in a place where you can't get a decent signal out, there's plenty of good places where you can put up a simple antenna with a fishing pole and have a lot of fun. So I would encourage you, one way or the other, to actually get out there and do some relatively low-priced DXing. Thank you very much. <laughs>